Hello, my name is Ann Purvis, and I'm one of the leaders of the Toronto Field Naturalist Juniors Program. This is a slideshow that was put together for our eighth nature class, Spring 2021. Participants in the class send in photos of nature adventures they've had that week, or drawings they've done from nature, or any creative craft and they appear in this slideshow. It allows us to share with one another what we've been doing and participate in each other's adventures. Some of our members have done a drawing class with Sandra Iskandar and they drew the wood duck. Sandra sent in a drawing of hers and her daughter Sienna and Alexi and these are the drawings on the left here and Amara sent in her drawing of the wood duck which is on the right. It must have been a wonderful experience to dive into those rich colors and try to reproduce them. Thanks for sharing. We're going to focus some attention on marshes today and start with things that are underwater. So this movie was made by Amara and I challenged the group to guess what this is. It is a leech. The longest one in Ontario can grow to over 30 centimeters. Um, we, I wondered if anyone had ever experienced having a leech uh, stuck to their arm or leg. You might have had one and not noticed at first. Leeches need to be very secretive in order to get a nice long chance to suck your blood. So they inject an anticoagulant and a painkiller into the wound so you won't even feel it. Leeches are actually perfectly safe. Although they drink your blood, they don't transmit any diseases. They are hermaphrodite. I think Amara told us about snails being hermaphrodite earlier in this program. This means they have both male and female parts. They are also very good parents and will hover over their young and fan them to stop fungus and bacteria from infecting them. They also carry around their young once they hatch till they are independent. I asked um, the group if anyone remembered any of the tricks that Andrew taught us for identifying frogs. Some of us identified these as green frogs and one of the reasons we know this is because although they have the large tympanum which is larger than the eye like the bullfrog, they have this fold of skin that stretches all the way down the back. On a bullfrog this just curls around the eye, it does not go all the way down the back. The green frog also has this green upper lip and the male has this bright yellow throat. And several of us knew that the green frog makes the banjo string sound, the boing uh, sound. So several people guessed that this is a sparrow, but obviously a different one from the one we're used to seeing in the city, the house sparrow. This sparrow has a bright red head and a pronounced white eye stripe. It is a chipping sparrow. So chipping sparrows spend the summer in Ontario and the winter down south. Cool to see this bird taking advantage of a pool of water to have a bath. Chipping sparrows tend to build their nests in evergreens or tangles of vine and shrub, usually at the end of a branch but well hidden and less than 10 feet off the ground. This again reminds us of how dangerous it is for many songbirds to nest in the city because they do nest close to the ground. So I asked the group um, what group this bird belonged to. We have many different groups of birds. We have songbirds, we have birds of prey, we have uh, shorebirds, and um, the group correctly guessed that this bird belongs to the shore group bird. They are the birds that run along shorelines and pick up bugs in the sand. There are three small ones and all of them are called peeps. We know this is the least sandpiper because it has yellow legs. This bird nests on the shores of the Arctic Ocean and the shores of Hudson's Bay. It is a real privilege to see them in migration because we do, they do not nest around here. Someone asked why they go so far. I read an article recently about the evolution of bird migration and it is believed that they originated in temperate zones and seek safety in the tropics from the cold weather. 
rather than the other way around. So fledgling Canada geese can swim, walk, and feed right off the bat. So we thought, we considered the question in our group on Wednesday night of why a family sticks together if the babies are already so competent at birth. It is entirely for safety purposes. The male and the female are very aggressive to any um, one approaching the babies and you can see this this is one of the ways the picture on the right is one of the ways in which they will be aggressive towards or hostile towards anyone getting too near them. The male and the female have a greeting that they do with each other which it would be cool to watch for. Apparently uh, when one leaves the family group or the nest and returns the male gives a two note call and then waits for the female to give a unique one note call. It is so carefully timed, it sounds like they are singing a duet. They go back and forth between the two of them. So I thought this was a really sweet photo of the baby stretching its wings. Obviously they can't fly at, uh, right at birth. <laughs> The Toronto Region Conservation Authority, which runs Leslie Street Spit, has tried to create nesting habitat for common terns and Caspian terns at Tommy Thompson Park. They have placed rafts in a couple of places. This island that they built was an instant success. Terns make a shallow scrape and then sandbag it with vegetation to keep it from flooding. They can drink on the wings, so they hover and suck up water. Many of us have seen them fishing. They take fish from the surface of the water, but occasionally dive underneath it as well. So this is a pair of trumpeter swans, and we know that they are the native trumpeter swan because of the black bill. Uh, the TRCA has put platforms out to encourage them to nest at teeth. Uh, Tommy Thompson Park as well. Someone asked about the yellow tag on the trumpeter swan. Trumpeter swans are uh, carefully monitored because they were very close to being eradicated from Ontario and are just making a comeback now. We're now going to switch to looking at forest habitat. And so these are two spring ephemerals which come up quickly and bloom before the leaf canopy is out. So the one on the left is Jack in the Pulpit, and it has a tiny little spadix right inside this folded leaf. And the spadix has both male and female parts. If it is young or under stress, it only produces male flowers on the spadix under the hood. As it gets older or is in better conditions, it will make female flowers. When seeds form, they can, they're contained in huge red berries. The flower on the right is mayapple, and I think that this is a mayapple that hasn't yet bloomed. It has a huge white flower, but it produces um, an actual fruit that is edible. Amara took this video of, of forest tent caterpillars. They are native to North America and can cause defoliation of cherry and apple trees and other members of the rose family. This is a picture of a choke cherry tree on the right. The trees usually recover. The eggs of the forest caterpillar overwinter in a huge mass of 200 eggs uh, encased in a black covering. When they emerge, they stick together and spin this web that we can see in the film. And they go out to feed on the leaves of the tree in the morning and the evening. They have lots of natural predators, which is why we don't have to worry overly much about them um, because they are native pests. Lots of parasitoid wasps lay their eggs in these caterpillars or feed them to their young. We were camping at, at our property this past weekend and saw a song sparrow land in this alder shrub on the left. Um, it sat there for a while and then dove into the grass at the base of the tree. We searched around and sure enough, the song sparrow had a nest with these beautiful, five beautiful eggs. It was very difficult to find the nest and you really had to because it was covered with uh, some of this dried grass was not visible at all and it reassured me we have coyote on our property 
and it reassured me that the coyote would have a hard time finding it too, that a sparrow had done such an excellent job of hiding it. Some of the branches of the alder also had these strange white waxy lumps on them. These are made by aphids. The harvester butterfly, which we also had flying around uh, while we were there, is, is bright orange but very small, lays its eggs among these aphids. And the caterpillar eats this honeydew made by the aphids, but it also eats the aphids themselves. It is our only caterpillar that actually eats animals. All other caterpillars are vegetarian. So these are some of the little pine cones that you find on alder. And sometimes it might be rather confusing or strange to see little pine cones on a tree that has deciduous leaves. So this is an orchard oriole on the left. We don't see it as often as we see the Baltimore oriole. So we played the game I Spy and everyone had to guess what I was thinking of. I picked the orange spot um, just above the beak on the barn swallow and people had trouble figuring out what I was thinking of. So this is a video of the Dawn Chorus at our island property uh, this past weekend and I challenged everyone to see how many distinct uh, songs they could hear. So two stunning sights to end our slideshow, an indigo bunting on the left and a flower in the pink or dianthus family on the right. The pink family have many members that are beautiful garden flowers like carnations and sweet williams. We also have some wild members of the family, bouncing bet and bladder campion. The indigo bunting spends the winter in the Caribbean and nests throughout southern Ontario in brushy areas or forest edges. They eat a wide variety of insects and moths, reminding us of the importance of planting lots of native vegetation so insects have something to feed on. They will eat grass seeds and other seeds and berries also during the winter. The female makes a nest in low vegetation a few feet off the ground. Again, important to keep our cats in the house during the breeding season.